with that, today's presenter is Kevin McCormick, and Kevin has been with Unify for over 15 years now. He's had various technical roles, including support, consulting, uh, pre-sales, and is also our lead trainer for many of our development products, including NXJ. So it's a great opportunity and a real privilege to have someone with his background and experience with NXJ presenting today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Hey, thanks, Matt. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you are in this world. Let's see, our agenda for today, we'll go over a quick overview of NXJ for those that aren't as familiar with it or just uh, getting introduced to it. Then we'll go into what the topic is about business services inside NXJ, what they are, how you create them and work with them, and what other options you have inside the NXJ environment um, instead of or in addition to the business services, and then using those same business services as, as web services. Depending on timing, we'll go into a demo, and depending on whether you have questions or not, because uh, of course we'll answer all of them as we're going along here. Now, some might ask about the picture in the corner here. Those that have attended other webinars of mine, I usually try and find what's going on during that week or that day. And this week is the Bike to Work Week, and we took a little more humorous approach of this. Um, one of our other presenters usually is sort of a tennis player. We, we like to think he's a pretty good athlete. We thought he might try and branch out, so this, we're, we're thinking this is Matt Brunquell and is a soon-to-be-found sport. So NXJ, NXJ is a development environment that focus on pro, focuses on productivity of the developer. So uh, basically a 4GL type environment for the Java world. It's a complete environment, so development, deployment, access any JDBC database, browser-based applications are the end result. Um, and in fact, you end up with AJAX components, you use controls to create that application. It's very data aware has a complete event model to use in the programming to make you, the developer, very productive in making applications quickly, easily, and robust ones. And you'll see we've, made, we've won awards along the lines here for that productivity. Again, that's sort of been Unify's focus for all of its tools, and it continues with NXJ. Now, why are we here today? Really, so what are we solving with this webinar? And, I, and we decided to put this slide in here because one of the things we added in in NXJ 11.6 timeframe um, was what we call business services. And we'll go over that in the whole webinar. But because we also have a services-oriented architecture environment in NXJ, or the ability to both consume and provide web services, it's been the impression that a lot of developers think that business services are just for providing web services, and, and that's really far from the truth. So we want to go into the why you care about these and how to use them effectively inside your application. So again, productivity is a, is a mainstay of Unify products, and it's not bad to make your life easier too. Okay, so just what are biz, NXJ business services? The easy way, and usually how we explain them in a the class, is that they're a Java class that have the NXJ extensions onto that, so the 4GL behavior. For those that come from Excel and Vision or other development products for character-based applications and client server on Windows and Unix, they behave very much like a global function that you're used to for putting common code in. So inside this business service, what we allow are things that are harder to do in regular Java, and we'll see a comparison a few slides later. You can access the database connection your application is running against. You can use the easy SQL syntax of the exec SQL for, call, for doing insert, update, delete, queries, store procedure calls. That's available. All the knowable data types are available, whether they are for getting null values from the database or storing them back in. So instead of having to work with regular Java types that are a little hard to deal with with nullable values. And then there's a session object. So w whether it's trying to display a message box, na um, navigate to another form, do updates, transaction control, that's all available inside the business service rather than having to pass that information, well, as we'll see when we talk about the Java object. Now, where most have seen the business service is in reference to a web service and the SOA environment. Certainly that's available, and we'll do our last part of our presentation regarding that. 
but you can take your business logic and deploy it as a web service with literally one check of a checkbox. And that will generate the WSDL for consumption by other clients um, and it will automatically deploy it. But I'm getting ahead of myself because we'll cover that in multiple slides later. Okay, so on to business services. What we want to talk about is some suggestions for organizing the business services, what the actual syntax is for the business service, and how you extend them or subclass them, how you use them by instantiating them, and then how you actually have them do some work by calling the methods on those business services. So we always advocate planning ahead and thinking about how you're going to organize your applications, both for maintainability and understanding of that when other developers begin working on it, and just for general organization. Everything in NXJ that code related goes underneath the classes folder. That, that's how the world behaves according to NXJ. We usually organize the business services underneath the folder beneath that just to keep them separate. And then we organize them based on whether they are database specific or behavior specific operations like database services in the picture here or their form or data view specific ones. And you can go more granular than that. We just want to give a flavor for how this, um, some organization suggestions. Okay, so how do you create them? Like in XJ, like everything else in XJ, it's pretty darn easy. Right mouse on anywhere inside the classes, new business service. And you get a, a vanilla template that just has the container name, the package name, and then the service name, so service one in the picture here. Now, if we look at the documentation, the actual syntax available for the service is that basic template that we create, but you also can add, and what we care about is the extends clause, and we'll see that in just a bit, to make it a subclass of other business services. So you can have, you can piece together um, a more complex business service by having it extend another business service and carry that chain on down. So if we look at a business service from one of our demo applications, we have one, it's called Calculate Ship Service. It takes in an order number and returns a complex object, a ship object. And I've highlighted the parts that we care about really for this. We can ignore the assignment of the return object. But you'll notice inside this object, it is able to use the exec SQL syntax without having to do a JDBC get connection, prepare the statement, execute the statement, go through the result set. None of that's required here. That's all available with the same coding you would have used in the event section inside the NXJ form. So this is just one example and certainly can be more complex. As we go through the slides, we've done really simple ones just to make it more understandable so you're not having to stare at code and try and figure out what's going on. Okay, so I mentioned that you can have the extends clause just uh, to subclass one, and unlike how you do things with forms inside the IDE, where you do a right mouse and do a subclass and you can't just modify the extends clause in the 4GL, with a business service, because there's no graphical portion to it, you can simply add the extends clause to the service qualifier, if you will, and that will immediately inherit any methods, variables, that are defined in that parent one. So in this case, our data view functions extends our form functions, and we won't get into discussion about which one should extend which because of our Java hierarchy in, in XJ. That's sort of a, an aside one from, if you see in our NXJ documentation, the NXJ form is actually a subclass of our data view because it has the data aware knowledge. Okay. So for those that are used to doing Java work, the next few slides may be okay. This is basic information. But for those that come from a 4GL environment, like either Excel or Vision or Team Developer or other Windows-based product, some of these things may not be as obvious. You may understand why you have to do them. So to first work with the business service, you have to instantiate it which means you have to create an object of that type. So I've highlighted in yellow here, we're going to create a, a, a variable called service2 that's of the type data view functions, 
And we have to construct it. We have to do the new syntax. So new data view functions with open close paren. It'll use the default constructor method. And you don't have to worry about that. You just have to know the basic syntax. So at this point, SVC2, as well as SVC1 above it, are available for use, and you can call methods on those. And you'll notice I did an import of business services.db services. I did that just so I didn't have to type out a really long statement there to do the instantiation. So that allows access to the data view functions inside DB services. Okay, so now that we have a pointer to an object of SVC2, we can invoke methods on it. So, and this is just like any other method call, whether it's a Java class on an entry form, as we'll see, or a local method. You have the object, SVC1, in this case, is parent saved. It's a method that's on that service. And we're passing it our data view object, and it returns a Boolean value back. Um, so, just want to show you how to, how to do this. Certainly, the calls can be much more complex, whether you're passing in complex arrays and structures, or just simple ones like we're doing here. And actually, I'm, I'm going to go backwards here for a moment, even though I don't normally do that in webinars. The reason that you have to instantiate the business service is, and you, is because the Exec SQL and the session statement that you can do in there require it to be a non-static class, or the methods can't be stack methods. So instead of being able to just call them directly without having an object, an instance of it, you have to instantiate it. Not a big deal, but I wanted to at least just mention that there's, as, um, as some of you start working with this, you'll say, well, why can't I just do a static method? That's because of the things you're trying to do don't allow that. So you have to, therefore, when you call it, create an instance of it. Okay, so let's talk about other ways you could do things instead of business services. So either we can either use a straight Java class, we can use an entry form that has local methods that are accessible at runtime, and you also have a base class form that you've subclassed other forms off of. So the Java class, it doesn't have any of the niceties of the NXJ business service or the in XJ4GL. So that means you have to do a couple of things if you're going to try and mimic the behavior of, of a business service. First of all, you have to import all the NXJ classes, or at least the ones you're going to use. So you have to figure that out, whereas with the business service, just like the form, that's already available. Then if you're going to do anything with the session or the database connection for that matter, you have to pass that information in. So we say the session here, but we'll see that you also have to pass in the connection information. And finally, if you're doing any database operations, you don't have the exec SQL syntax. So you end up getting the database connection, preparing a statement, setting up parameters, looking at the metadata for the return parameters potentially, and then working with the result set manually. So there are times that that's useful, but in most cases, this is just more work for you, more debugging, more syntax, potential errors. Um, the goal, again, is to make your life easier. So if we look at an example of this common theme we're doing here, of just getting an invoice count for a specific number, what you'll notice is we have to import our NXA manager data connection, NXA data connection, and our NXA session object. And then we have the parameter list for this function, this method, get invoice count, that has to take in the data connection and the session object. And if we look at the code for the operation inside this method, we have to get the JDBC connection, we have to create the SQL statement, we have to set up a result set and execute the query, and then result, uh, scroll through the result set doing the next operation. And we also have to do cleanup as well. We have to close the statement. Um, so I, I will pause here for a moment and say that if you need to do dynamic SQL, as in construct an SQL statement by piecing together a string rather than knowing what your statement is going to be beforehand, this is really the way to do it, is to do the JDBC connection and prepare a statement because an XJ doesn't have dynamic SQL with the exact SQL syntax. You go to JDBC to do that. So that's the one case. 
with a Java class may be used for you. Um, and certainly if you already have Java classes pulled in from other projects or things you've grabbed or borrowed from the web or whatnot, certainly you can use a Java class. There's no restriction in XJ for that. We're just trying to point out how business services can be more productive and easier to use. Okay, so call the Java class. Similar operations that you import the Java class, you then instantiate it, and then you call the method on it. So the invoice functions, get invoice count, and you pass, in this case we're having the pass the get connection, which is a method available off of our form, um, and it'll pass our session object and the company ID. So we had to pass two more parameters in here, and they had to be used over in the Java class. So before we had the business service, a lot of customers would put methods um, to be used throughout the application on the entry form. So they, I don't want to say user word overloaded, but they made the entry form large with a lot of functionality. And one of the reasons they would do this was that this was a common launch point of their application, which means they knew how to point to it from their later on forms in the form stack. And so, be, so the entry form became a place for information that you'd expect to have there, user information, the selected customer that you're working with, so you have current state information. But then methods for doing common shared code ended up getting put in there too, whether it's doing SQL statements um, that are commonly used or error handling. Uh, it became a common repository for those. Uh, so it became a little more unmanageable because their entry form just became that much larger, took longer to compile. In addition, in order to call an operation, on, a method on the entry form, again, you had to know the form name. And you would do that then using the hash mark, the pound sign syntax, which is one of the next day niceties for referencing a form on the form stack. So the way that you would have done that would have been putting that same basic method with the NXJ accelerators in it in our entry form, and again, unless the syntax is easier than the straight Java one, where you can, and so we're doing just a select from our invoice table, and we have to do a return. And you'll note that while inside the regular NXJ commands or events, the try catch is implied through those, inside a method, even if it's inside an NXJ form or a business service, it has to have a try catch around it. So just a little tidbit there. Okay, so we have it on entry form, and to call it later on, to call that method, you'll notice this is on our second form. What we do is we do the entry form pound sign, so that will find it on the form stack, and does the call to it. The bad part again is that you have to hard code the form name here. So if you have multiple entry points, that becomes problematic. And you've made your entry form large and uh, unwieldy potentially for maintenance and just generally uh, keeping track of things. So we prefer to pull some of those operations that used to be put in entry form into a business service. And just to pause for a moment here, recall that at this point here we haven't talked anything about web services or anything. This is a way to take your business logic and put it into a separate object in your project to allow you to encapsulate and categorize your application instead of having to, as in this example, put it all in one place. Okay, so another option is to put the code, your method, into a base class. So either your base form to all of your form subclass off of, or potentially a data view. Um, and there's that is actually one of the better options to do than putting them all into the entry form because then they're available. It still means your base classes tend to have a lot of functionality and that may not be used by a lot of the application, but it's better in my mind than putting them all in the entry form. Now, one thing it does mean is that you do have to plan ahead and make sure you have your inheritance set up correctly before you do this. So if you already have an application and you haven't done that, it's probably not worth it to retrofit um, and use base classes, easier just to use a business service. So again, same code, same method operation, but now we put the code into a base form, any form subclass off of this or 
child, grandchild, great-grandchild will inherit that methane, you can call it, we have on the next slide, straight from the subclass form just by referencing the method name, passing the parameter into it. It'll grab it, the parameter from the local form, pass it to the method inherited, and get to your results. And again, um, you have to, it's probably not better to retrofit that. If you're already doing, doing inheritance, it's not a bad idea to do it in this fashion. Okay, so that's an overview, although it'll be a very fairly quick one. We want to introduce business services so you know they're there and can start looking and using them. As the business services being used as global functions, if you will, or Java classes that are easier to use for doing whether it's SQL or session object and so on. But what we do want to visit and make sure we don't forget is that those business services serve another purpose, which is them being possible as web services. So we want to talk about how you enable the business service to become a web service, how you deploy it, how you can manage it, and then just a review of that of the WSDL, the whistle that generated for the web ser business service as a web service. So as I mentioned earlier, to take a business service and make it into a web service truly is one checkbox. You go to the property tab for that business service, check the publishes web service. That will, at compilation time, generate the WSDL for deployment and the deployment descriptor automatically. We need to deploy the project either through the development environment or externally, you will then, it will then automatically get deployed to our web services engine. And that makes it quite easy to do. Now, a tidbit here, as we're preparing for the webinar, I happen to have Oracle installed on my laptop. And if you do that, it nicely takes over port 8080 for its console. And this is not uncommon, or you may have other ports you want to use. If you're doing what, taking your business services and turning them into web services with that checkbox, and you're not using the standard port 8080 for JBoss, you want to add a new environment variable called WASP port, W-S-P-P-O-R-T, and set that to your new port. So in my case, I just use 8088, and so I've set that. If you don't do that, you'll get errors about trying to do a lookup. So the console snapshot on the bottom part of this slide is showing something that happens when the application is deployed. It does a lookup of the web service to make sure it's there when you deploy your NXJ project. And so you'll see this WASP lookup with the URL of what the web service is. And thus it says port 8080 in that. Again, if you already if you have your web server set up under a different port and forget to set this environment variable default to 8080, and you'll get errors about unable to do the lookup. So it's a, an indication to you that to go back and change the port. Okay, so how do you manage web services and see what's available on them and undeploy them if you need to and just see what's going on with them? There is a web services console that we use, the SystemNet Web Service Engine. It's called the WASP tool, and there's a console for it. It's off of your server, whatever port it is, SystemNet slash server slash admin slash console. One of the most important things in this webinar is the password that's the default for this. It used to be an older version, admin, and then admin is the default password. We changed that a couple of versions ago to admin, and the default password is the word change it. So if you're trying to go to the console and you keep going admin, admin, because we changed it, and you should change your password, but get to it first. Okay, so what you'll see in the console are a couple of things. I split the images to two separate ones just for space. You get a list of the packages that have been deployed, and then the web services are deployed in the packages, and we'll do a couple of slides on those web server on those uh, different views. So if we look at the server packages by selecting that section, we get the deployment view of all the packages that are deployed. So in this case, we have our web my webinar work here. We have our sample invoice system that has a service on it, and then we have to have our NXJ demo that has a num next number service available on it. So we look underneath the package description there. One of the useful things here is if you have some trouble with your web service, 
You can come here and undeploy it by using the trash can icon on the right side there. Um, in the case of the port change I mentioned, it's almost easier to clean it up here and then change it and redeploy it. So if we drill down over underneath the packages and we choose our business service webinar one, we can then see the endpoints, the URLs and the WSDL links are generated. So you can click on those, get the WSDL, we'll see one in just a few slides. Now, if we scroll down further in that web services console, we'll see underneath web services, we'll see the actual services that are deployed, and then you can click on those to get more details about them. So if we click on the customer functions, we'll see that, uh, again, we get that URL to the WSDL. Um, there's some monitoring you can do there, get more details about the package it's deployed on. In general, you don't need to go to the console, but I point out here because if you're familiar with it, you know it exists, and you know sort of where to go to look for information. Okay, so the what the whistle that's generated from creating a web a business service, checking the checkbox, and deploying it um, is shown here. And this is a get invoice count one that we've been working with. We have one input parameter it ends up being a generic name of P0. It's an integer. We have the one response parameter, which is also an integer, um, and just about as simple as it gets. It could be a more complex, either input type or return type, and that would show up here as well, and it would give information about the um, return types there, complex or not. Okay. Now, we have a few minutes here, so we're going to go over to the NCA environment and just to show this behavior, um, and then we'll go to Q&As, but I always like to end on a demo. So we have the NCA development environment, and truly creating a business service is literally a few clicks away. So we'll create a new project. Business service demo. We may want to turn this into a web service, so we'll say include the active SOA jars on our class path. It would have asked that later had we forgotten to do that here. We'll do our connection. Those that have used our demo applications and SQL base as our database. We'll be familiar with the island database. We'll give it a JNBI name for the connection. And if I typed everything correct, and the connection is successful. We'll do a base class here. Um, this is sort of a hint of what we'll see once we get to an exchange 12.1, whatever our next version is here for some base classes. And we now have an app. We now have our project, the standard NXJ Flare. We'll create a folder, business services. And as we saw in the demo, we can create a new business service. We'll call it invoice. We'll keep it this level. And so now we have our function here, our um, business service. And if we want to create a method to get to the sum of a count of, for a specific customer, sum of their invoices. So we could do a public. No, let's just do our account one again here, because otherwise we're doing big decimals and some other ones for a demo here. We'll say it's integer return, and we'll do get count of companies. We'll do really easy ones here. And because of that, we're going to get a company count. This is a, will be a very simple one. So our code here. Now we do need to do the try cat, so we'll set up our block here for that. So now we're just going to do an exec SQL oh, we didn't do our variable declare our integer value and count set that to zero as our default so we don't need to do anything else into new count takes longer to type than it does to do the code now, if we get an error, 
we could do things like ex dot print stack trace send it out to the server log but maybe we want to give a message to the user so this is where we have access to our reception object there we're getting company account so we'll print the stack trace and I'll give them an error there as well and our final thing we need to do is we do have to do a return since we have an integer value. Well, let's do a return. I have a typo up there. Equal sign is probably a good thing. Okay, and final close from our method. And so now we have a basic NXJ method inside a business service. We'll verify that it compiles here. Unless, as I always say during the demos, the first time you compile inside a project, you have to copy over a variety of items. After that, it, it uh, becomes quick. So we'll watch uh, the compilation here, and we'll go do a form to call this. So one of the other things that's useful inside the business service while we're waiting for this is the exec SQL syntax as a using connection clause. Uh, those that are astute will note that I declared my variable inside my try cat try block, and it really needs to be outside that. Otherwise, it's not accessible. Okay. So one last thing for properties on the on the business service. If you're not going to have a dynamic connection, you're going to use whatever connection is being used in the rest of the application or a specific one. Good idea to set the connection property for the business service. Okay, so we will go ahead while we're here, mark this as a web service. And what we'll do, we'll create a new form. And we'll create a button on here. And we'll do a very good name. And then we'll call it Git. Close command and get company count. One thing we need to do is that we don't have a form, any fields here, we'll say stop without fields on this form. And now let's go create our command. We call this. Set the structure for it. Now remember we said we had to instantiate this. So I'm going to click over to our project tab so I get the spelling right. So I can do business services. Business service equals new. No business services. That invoice function. New. Let me see if I got that correct here. I think actually you might have a, a typo on the invoice function. Invoice function. And how you originally named it. Uh, you're yeah. right. Good job there. Thank you, Paul. Good set eyes. I don't even try and pronounce that. Okay, so until that compiles now, we'll probably have an error. We'll catch that in a moment. So now we have the instance of it. So now we can do int equals. Now I don't have our method name, so I'm going to go over and copy it. Get company count. And we have no parameters in this case. Let's we'll concatenate that together. And now let's go ahead and make changes, compile changes, and see what syntax errors they have, if any, thanks to Paul's good eyes on my <laughs> spelling. So there's an error there. Let's go back and start at the beginning and compile our invoice functions. And again, most likely a. Yeah, let's go back to our form, compile it, and see if it still gives an error. Invoice function, business services, invoice functions that class. Okay, we're going to do one other thing here because there's a possibility this is because our. Oh, I want to do a folder, not a form. Folder. 
to remove our form one into there. And what we're going to do to make this easier so I don't have to type this twice. This is where I was saying the import is easier sometimes. So import that. Again, and see if I have a typo or if I have it correct now. Okay, we have another error done. We'll see how that goes when, when we get to this. Okay, so the last thing we need to do is add the entry form. So we can run this guy and let's see what happens. Let's compile our extra form we created. So I always like to, those who have seen other webinars of mine, I usually like to watch the uh, JBoss console since I start up manually so you can see the deployment happen. Uh, and so those of you that were paying attention during the webinar will notice I just forgot to change my WASP port. So that will not work on this first one here. In fact, we'll see the local host. I, I really want to show you the failure case here. So the regular NXT application will be fine, but we'll get these errors about the port change. We have our form with our button that says press. So we have 24 companies. I know it's an exciting service. What we don't have is our web service here. So what I'm going to do is go over to our project properties. And this is where I said that you'd get an error if you didn't do it. I want to reinforce that. We'll say default 888. Go ahead and deploy this again. And while we're doing that, we'll go ahead and go to our WASP console. Wait for the deployment to finish. See if my login is timed out here. Okay, let's go to our deployment for packages. Go down, drill down server packages. And we have business service demo, which is one we just created. And we have invoice functions. And we'll see now that we have the whistle for the invoice function, even though we're doing get company name here. So get count companies there. And you'll see that the response type is basically an int. There is no input parameters. But there you have it. Taking your logic, putting it into a business service for ease of use for coding, and then also being able to expose that as a web service to other NXJ applications or .NET or team developer, anybody to Perl, anything that can call a web service. So with that, we'll now get back to the PowerPoint and ask if there's any questions. Yes, this is uh, your host, Paul Lamelli, reminding you to use the Q&A button on your WebEx toolbar marked with a question mark if you have any questions. Uh, we do have a couple of questions already coming in, so we'll give you just a quick minute to submit those questions, and then we'll go ahead and get them answered for you. So the first question that we have coming in is, what is the current version of NXJ, and do we have an upcoming release? 
And the answer is the current version of the software is 12. Uh, we do have a, an upcoming release scheduled. I believe that it is scheduled for later on this year. It will be a point release, meaning it'll be probably a, a, a 12.1 type uh, release. And again, that is scheduled for later this year. Yeah, and just as a teaser for some of those that are paying attention to that, um, it'll have an updated series of UI controls, so the, the toolbars you're used to, um, as well as one thing right in there is dynamic grid, so you can dynamically create a grid object based on your query instead of having to hard code all the columns in there every time. The next question is, it says, I'm an, I'm an Excel SQL customer and use RPT for reporting. What is available with an XJ? Right. Good question. So if you're coming from Excel or Vision that you use RPT, well, there wasn't a graphical reporting solution, what you do end up doing now is, is using either the open source Jasper reports, which is what multiple of our customers do, or you use our NXJ reporting solution, which has a full J2W server-based reporting solution with scheduling um, and background reporting and automatic emailing of reports. So those are your two options available. Um, and there are a couple, and in fact, if you go back to a previous webinar, there are a couple of nice things we added in NXJ to make things like screenshots of grids and repeating areas or forms easily brought up and printable. Not necessarily related to reporting, but some customers have used those effectively. And the next question is NXJ training available? And that's actually a very good question. Kevin actually heads up our NXJ training, so we couldn't have a, a better person here to, to help answer that. But uh, NXJ training is available. We do it here uh, at headquarters, and I believe the course is about four or five days long, uh, depending on what you're looking to, to get out of it. We also have on-site training available if that makes more sense as well. So you can always contact your local Unify representative if you have any questions about training. And just to expand on that, um, for the timeline, it's three days for the base NXJ class, which is the developer and web services. Um, and then if you're doing either our business process management tool or our reporting tool, those are an additional day for each of those. Great. So if there are no further questions, I think we're going to conclude today's webinar on using business services in NXJ. And be sure to mark your calendar for next week's webinars, I believe, on Team Developer and Q. And if you have any further questions, please contact your local Unify representative, or you can always send an email to uh, info at unify.com. So also make sure to fill out the surveys at the conclusion of this webinar, and feel free to suggest any topics that you would like Unify to cover in the future. Many of the webinars that we have been doing over the past few months have come out of suggestions that we have received through the uh, questionnaires. And I just wanted to say a quick uh, hi to Sharman from our distributor in South Africa who's <laughs> on the line here. I had the honor of being down there a few years ago and had a great time. So I just want to say hey to them. Thank you.